it is indeed our pleasure to be uh, welcoming Sri Kiran Kumar to deliver uh, today's public lecture. I want to thank uh, Astronomical Society of India for giving me an opportunity to visit Srinagar and also share with uh, people here on what ISRO has been doing in general and in particular in space science, what activities we have been doing. One of the things which people keep reminding us of is whether India has done the right thing by getting into space technology. ISRO never had any doubt on that. It's simply because the whole activity started with the vision of Vikram Sarabhai, who saw as early as in the 60s, in the beginning itself, you all remember in 1957, when the first Sputnik was put by the Russians into space, Americans and Russians were really competing with each other to demonstrate who is more capable. At that time, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai's thinking was how a new technology, a space technology can be used for developing our country to hasten the progress. And it was his vision that initiated the whole process of bringing in space technology to India. And the activities which have been carried out by ISRO during the last five decades is really fulfilling one of those dreams of his. From the initial starting in the early 1963, we had the first launch of a sounding rocket from Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Site, where Dr. Vikram Sarabhai was able to convince his friends from various countries, whether it is America, Russia, or France, where he was able to convince them that sounding rockets launched from Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Site will help carrying out upper atmospheric research and through that process, bring in this new technology to start with as a kit and then subsequently doing the indigenous development. The first launch took place on the 23rd of November 1963 from the Indian soil at that time. And from that point of time till 28th of April, when we launched our IRNSS, we have completed about 134 missions, out of which 79 are the satellites and 53 launch vehicles we have put into orbit. In addition to that, we have also put in a space recovery experiment and a crew module recovery experiment, these two where an object which was sent into space has been brought back to Earth, getting through the atmospheric friction, surviving that, and these activities have been demonstrated. So in this process of doing 134 missions, we have also been able to put about 57 satellites for 21 countries as part of the activities what we have done so far. And we have been able to develop for this launch vehicles, what is called a polar satellite launch vehicle, geostationary satellite launch vehicles. Today we have in operation 35 satellites, 13 communication satellites, providing capability of broadcasting, television connect, telephone connectivity, and also VSAT communication. Then we have 13 Earth observation satellites, providing us information about cyclones, about crop yield forecasting, and urban development, water resources monitoring, a host of things. We have seven navigation satellites and two space science satellites, one MOM, Mars Arbiter mission, and we have also an AstroSat, which is currently in operation. Just to remind you that ISRO started its work primarily to bring in the space technology for development in the country. The activity started in 1975. Today, coming, starting from that time, if you look at today, we have built, like I said, about 35 satellites, which is able to provide information about the entire country in terms of whether it's vegetation monitoring or whether it is water body monitoring and also creating digital elevation model essential for the infrastructure building, cartographic applications, and also the navigation systems, what we have put, whether it is Gagan, or the recent IRNSS, using all this information 
today we are able to work with a large number of central government and state government departments and provide space-based inputs for effective monitoring as well as planning activities in the country. Another major development that has happened is in terms of the navigation systems where along with the Airports Authority of India, ISRO is able to provide for the Indian subcontinent for all those receivers which can be carried on the aircraft for en route planning as well as for landing. This provides a very useful signal and it enables GPS information to become more accurate to ensure safety of life assured location-based information providing. In addition to that, we have also been able to provide our own indigenous GPS system with IRNSS, which is very different from what rest of the world had adopted, primarily because we are looking at solutions for our country. And with this regional navigation satellite system of only seven satellites, compared with 28 to 32 satellites of others, we are able to provide India and surrounding India about 1,500 kilometers positioning information based on independent receivers. And just last month, we completed the seventh satellite in this constellation. And we are building the ground infrastructure and also the front-end chipsets required for making these chips available for entrepreneurs to provide location-based solutions in the future. Meteorology, probably some of you will remember in the earlier years, in the 70s and the 80s, when cyclones used to come, we used to have more than 10,000 to 15,000 people losing their lives. Today, because of the every half an hour images that are generated by the Earth observation carried from geostationary platforms, we are in a position to provide to the country a cyclone landfall with an error less than 20 kilometer in space and half an hour in time, as much as 48 to 96 hours in advance, because of which the Disaster Management Authority is able to actually evacuate people from the affected areas. And in the last few super cyclones which have hit the country, loss of life is less than single digit. This is one of the important contributions that ISRO has been making by using the meteorological satellites provided in our geostationary platform. From the starting point of the first sounding rocket, how in the initial days the sounding rockets were being carried on cycle, and then the initial activities, you'll be very interested to know that the launch vehicle activities started in a church and the satellite activities started in an industrial shed in Bangalore. Starting from such uh, positions, today you saw that we have been able to establish an independent polar satellite launch vehicle as well as geostationary satellite launch vehicle using our own indigenous cryo engines. In terms of the satellites, we had in Aryabhata, the first experimental payloads were put and in 75 we had the first launch and then there was also initially an opportunity for flying one of the space science instruments on space shuttle, Anuradha. And this lot of work was done at uh, PRL as well as TIFR for this uh, building this instrument. Then the major event of Chandrayaan it one itself, where Chandrayaan one, though man had landed on the moon and also a large number of missions had been done, done to moon, it is Chandrayaan one which gets the credit for identifying the processes responsible for OH and water molecules being present on the surface of moon. And the credit for this actually goes to Chandrayaan-1. And Chandrayaan-1 also is touted as an example of international collaboration, where we work with a large number of uh, countries and provided opportunities for them to put their payloads on this satellite. Uh, though the satellite itself did not survive its full mission, it did provide enough information from the various payloads that was carried just yesterday, I was seeing in one of the Nadiad universities where the data from Chandrayaan terrain mapping camera, the students were using to create the 3D model and also identifying some new craters on that. Today, a large number of students are working on the Chandrayaan-1 data for their doctoral work as well. And the Chandrayaan-1 was a big success even internationally because 
as I pointed out, it was demonstrated that it is possible to conduct space science missions at a cost which is very significantly different from what the Western world is used to. Mars Orbiter mission, of course, uh, all of you are quite familiar, but just to remind you, the kind of complexity of this mission was while we had been working on putting satellites into orbit, the initially we were building satellites for 36,000 kilometer geostationary orbit. And then when we did our moon mission, the satellite was at a height of almost four lakh kilometers. That means a factor of 10 beyond uh, our geostationary orbits. But still the satellite was within the gravitational influence of Earth. In the Mars mission, we were going at almost uh, 250 million kilometers the minimum distance and almost 400 million kilometers is the farthest distance. And the satellite has to be taken beyond the Earth's gravitational field and taken to space. So this was our first attempt to go beyond Earth's gravitational influence. And also because you have to do communication with the satellite, which is almost uh, 400 million kilometers away, you have to make sure that the communication systems you build for this is also effective. On the day of launch, that is on the 5th of November 2013, what you are attempting to do is put an object, make it into space, make it travel for about 650 million kilometers. And on 5th of November, you have to make sure that after on the 24th September 2014, morning 7.30 to the 2nd, this object should be in a cube of 50 kilometers. So the entire traversing from the point of launch till the 24th September to that second, you have to ensure control over this object, make sure that its trajectory is right, and it is at that point of time, at that exact location, because if you are not able to do that, the object will be lost into space. And also during the intermediate travel time, the kind of forces that could perturb its trajectory, even a small force of the solar radiation falling on the satellite itself could change the position at the end of this travel period. So you need to make sure that not only you determine the position of this satellite accurately all the time, but also you have to make sure that you control it in a sufficient manner so that you give it the right direction and the right velocity so that on the eventful day, you are in a position to reorient it and reduce its velocity to the sufficient magnitude to get captured by the Mars gravitational influence. And the satellite itself, you will not be able to control continuously. See, we are used to our geostationary satellites where from our ground stations, either in Hassan or in Bhopal, we have a 24 by seven connectivity to the satellite and anything that happens to the satellite can be monitored and you can command it to rectify if you encounter a problem. Whereas in the Mars mission, what you are going to encounter is at some points in time, for almost two months, you will not be able to do any communication with the satellite. So the satellite has to more or less fend for itself. If it encounters problem, it has to find out how to get into alternate control systems and make sure that the satellite is functioning well. So you have to build a large amount of autonomy into the satellite. And then in addition to that, you also make, need to make sure that the kind of communication system that you have put on the satellite, the, just to give you an idea, the antenna pointing error that can be tolerated is only two degrees. Even if everything is working on the satellite properly, and if its orientation is in error by about two degree, you have no communication with the satellite and you cannot practically do anything with the satellite. So that's the kind of complexity that was there. But given the dedication and the efforts of the ISRO scientists, all this happened. And today, GLOBE does recognize that ISRO has been able to do this activity at a very significantly lesser cost to what others have done. And while our initial mission was meant for only six months, today we have already crossed more than a year and a half. And the amount of fuel and the functioning of the satellite is such that it will continue to be there for quite some time. Our next major event that is going to happen is a long eclipse period. If we do not 
reorienter control the orbit, we'll be actually encountering a large, long eclipse duration, and we may not be able to survive that. But sometime in January next year, we are planning to do some maneuvers to avoid such a condition. Apart from Mars mission, recently we had the AstroSat mission, where again, it's a unique mission, primarily because the mission envisaged building the instruments. This is one of the issues which we keep uh, talking about, making more and more space science instrumentation realized in our academic institutions and scientists working on building such payloads for future. So this is an excellent example where the various academic institutions in the country have contributed to building payloads. And this particular platform is carrying a set of host of instrument, a combination the like of which does not exist today in any single platform. And already, like uh, Professor Kembavi mentioned, that now the currently the information is with the EPIs and uh, they are continuing to make these observations. And very soon, it's also going to be made available for the research community for providing certain specific observation times will be allocated to them and they will be able to carry out their research activities using this AstroSat mission. This AstroSat carried, like we said, from far UV to soft X-ray and the LAX PC, all these instruments on a common platform does not exist on any other space uh, systems today. So this is a unique opportunity available for the research community in the country to get some original data and work on that. Then we have the Chandrayaan-2 mission which is planned. Now this Chandrayaan-2 mission, originally we were planning to work with the Russians where they were supposed to give us the lander but subsequently the whole series of activities changed and today by end of next year or early 2018 we are planning to have our Chandrayaan-2 mission where we will carry our own lander and rover and you will have a soft landing of the lander on the moon surface. So unlike the moon impact probe carried on Chandrayaan-1, this uh, particular mission you will have an orbiter as well as a lander and it will carry out some in-situ observations on the surface of moon. Yeah, this gives you some more details on the, the instruments and also the configuration of the satellite itself. The rover, once it, lander, once it lands, there is a platform which will be coming out and this rover is now actually, the engineering version of that is getting tested in our uh, lunar surface simulation lab in Bangalore and the activities are going on full swing and just last week we completed the th throttleable engines that are required for making soft landing. So these were new developments and that throttleable engines have been demonstrated, performance has been demonstrated just last week where we can control the throttling from 100% to f almost 40% and then ensure controlled descent from the orbiting height of 100 kilometers on the moon's orbit to land on the moon itself with less than few meters per second velocity at the time of impact. Next slide. Yeah, so a number of uh, observational activities are planned on this. See, initially the orbit itself will be around uh, 100 kilometers and then later it will come down. And in situ analysis on the lunar surface it is planning. The next major mission we are working on is Aditya. And in the Aditya mission, again, what is being envisaged is here the opportunity is for looking continuously at sun on 24 by 7 mode and then using the solar coronagraph you can conduct experiments which, for doing equivalent of which many scientists would be spending years together and go to the total solar eclipse locations and conduct experiments. Whereas on this satellite which is going to be positioned in one of the Lagrange points they'll be able to do almost 24 by 7 observation of the solar coronal mass ejection and uh, a number of other parameters which can be monitored 
using a series of instruments and this project is also now in full swing and in about three years time this satellite is expected to be put into orbit. Then in terms of uh, the future activities itself, one of the thing is AstroSat, follow on for AstroSat is one of the things that we will be looking at and Mars mission, whether we should be doing another Mars mission immediately or a mission to Venus or asteroid, these are the questions which are being now debated. We have study teams which are looking at what should be our next mission. While definitely what will be there in the long run is we will be doing missions to Mars, Venus, asteroid, all of them and in fact uh, the follow on to AstroSat and even for Aditya we are looking at not just L1 but putting one more satellite at L5 also so that simultaneously from two locations you can carry on certain observations. So many of these things are in the planning stage and we are looking forward to more and more interaction with the academic institutions and the scientists in the country to drive our space programs primarily with the intention of enabling more and more fundamental work to be done in the country. So currently the, our uh, committee on the science, advisory committee on the science is actually looking at our next, beyond our currently planned three missions, that is Chandrayaan-2 and Lander and Rover, Aditya, this, beyond this, and Aditya-2, we are looking at what should be our next plans. And on this, maybe in a year's time, there'll be some more clarity on what will be our missions. Next slide. Okay, that in a nutshell is what I thought I should be talking to you about in terms of the activities that we are doing on space science. And while we started our activities uh, on space science from the sounding rockets in uh, Tumba, and even today we are doing a number of these sounding rockets on a regular basis, and we have moved up to now Mars, and now we are looking at going beyond Mars to maybe Venus and also to Lagrange points for continuing our space sojourn. Thank you.